what I wanted to start off sharing you is, is this um, diagram here. These are saltwater crocodiles. And in this area, in 1971, there were none. You could fly over all the rivers of the Northern Territory and see no crocodiles at all. So this was our particular program in the Northern Territory. It's very different context to what you have here. You have 300,000 square kilometres and 100 million people. We have 1.3 million square kilometres and 240,000 people. And 30% of those are indigenous. So it's highly unlikely that you will be able to achieve with saltwater crocodiles anything like this. But you may be able to have some areas somewhere where you can have reasonable numbers of saltwater crocodiles. But I guess what this tells you is I could not even have imagined something like this in the early 1970s. They were gone and there was a question as to whether we could ever come up with a mechanism to bring them back. But that has obviously happened and uh, it's quite a remarkable sight. When you look at other animals like tigers in 1971, they have gone down another 50% on what they were. Our crocodiles have gone up 20 times in abundance and 99 times in biomass. So it's achievable, even though in the Philippine context and in the context of many other high-density high people, countries in this region, you are probably unlikely to achieve this type of thing. So let me, I've got a PowerPoint to follow this, so if only it can organise the technology. But when I went to school, Mr. Byro had not even invented the Byro, you know, that we were. What I want to talk about really is this link between conservation and sustainable use and livelihoods. These things historically have not been well understood and yet they're very important for crocodiles. Only some, some crocodiles have commercial value for skins, others don't. Crocodiles are a, a wonderful production animal in terms of turning uh, waste meats to usable meats. In some countries now, one of the main focuses of farming is on meat rather than on skins due to uh, current trends. Let me try and work the technology here. This will be mainly focused on cro saltwater crocodiles that we're all familiar with. They're obviously um, just one one species that we're dealing with. Crocodiles, the whole family, uh, occur in many countries. There's you know, one to eight species and subspecies per country. They range in size from very big animals to quite small ones. But the thing to keep in mind is the antiquity of using crocodiles goes way back into prehistory times. In fact, I've argued that when the first primitive uh, primates came out of the first tree and went to have a drink at the first billabong, they were probably chased away by a crocodile, and they've been dealing with crocodiles ever since. They learned to kill them, they learned to eat their eggs, the crocodiles learned to eat them. So it's been a very uneasy alliance for many, many years. If you take a young baby and hold it up next to a crocodile, hang on to it tight because something deep inside them tells them that this is not a good place to be and they'll squirm and turn and 
I think it's a very primitive thing. I think it's locked in us uh, somehow, some distant memory from the past that when a crocodile turns and looks at people, they just know they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. They occupy the diversity of wetlands from the ocean right up to uh, tiny little pools up in mountain streams that they're uh, been, the fossil record indicates they've been very, very abundant in many places all over the world. The history, when you look back at it, goes way back. Like the, the Romans, the Egyptians used armour made out of crocodile skins, they were mummified crocs. The very, just about every culture in this region has close ties Crocodiles. So, you know, traditional knowledge of crocodiles is an incredibly important thing to understand because conservation really is, is comes down to ten words: tolerance, respect, and understanding of all people's cultures and traditions. If you don't like people, don't get into conservation because you won't make it work. It's people that conserve animals in the end, and uh, people are very important to the whole process. I think you know, St. George and the Dragon was the Europeans' first introduction to crocodiles way, way back, and they painted them as a dragon, but I'm fairly sure it was something like this that they encountered when they first started to move down into Africa. Where we are, Indigenous people live very much a traditional lifestyle. These people have been in Australia for something like 50 to 60,000 years. They are unbelievably um, skilled as hunters and gatherers, and they're not farmers at all. So that uh, being able to earn an income, as is expected of them today, is a very tricky challenge because they have tremendous skills in terms of hunting and gathering, but zero skills in terms of farming that require you to be in the one place at the one time, all the time. So for us in the north, 30% of our people are indigenous and something like 60% of the lands on which saltwater crocodiles occur are on indigenous lands and they are very much partners in the sustainable use programs. Historically, crocodile eggs were a major source of food and when crocodiles were really abundant, these people knew how to find the nests, where to find them and they were, they, they were just I don't know how many people have eaten crocodile eggs here, but they make a tremendous omelette. Very soft and fluffy and tastes very nice. Most of these people ate them raw, and uh, they were an, an annual source of food. If you look at the history of what's happened to crocodiles around the world, in recent times, there, there was use of Crocodile leather. During the American Civil War, uh, a lot of the southern people used alligator skins for boots and saddles and things like this. The 20s, the 1920s, when suddenly crocodile skin handbags somewhat accidentally made the market and people really liked them. During the Second World War, there was not much in the way of crocodile trade went on for obvious reasons. but. After the war, there was a tremendous upsurge in the demand for crocodile skin products. And there was very high levels of use around the world. Nobody at that time cared for crocodiles. They were seen as being a predator on people or just a nasty animal to be associated with. And so what you had was massive depletion on a global scale of crocodiles. But by the 1970s in most countries, there was very severe depletion. And in 1975, CITES came into being and for the first time restricted trade. Trade, all crocodiles were put on 
the appendices of sides and trade in wild crocodiles almost ceased to occur. During the 1980s, there was the realisation that trade could be sustainable and was important. And so country after country started to develop programs involving sustainable use of crocodiles. Sometimes these were from captive breeding, as is occurring here, but in other places it's through some form of wild harvest, collecting eggs or collecting animals. And where that's important is that it gives benefits back to landowners and um, it, it creates for crocodiles a political issue. If crocodiles are economically valuable, then governments uh, it's far more easy for governments to allocate animals to the con money to the conservation of an animal that's economically important and is supporting livelihoods than the one that is just disappearing that nobody really cares about. So believe me, in many cabinet rooms around the world, the fact that crocodiles are generating income is a very important political uh, move in terms of getting governments to take the conservation of crocodiles more seriously. The sort of thing that happened in the Northern Territory is shown here, that if you assume the population in the 40s was uh, where we were, was uh, complete, there was a massive decline up until protection was introduced and then gradually the population started to recover. And sustainable use programs were introduced during that recovery to give people reasons to uh, conserve crocodiles because at the time of protection there was nobody being attacked by crocodiles. They had ceased to exist. So when people said, well, let's conserve them so they do not go extinct, it was like saying, let's conserve unicorns or something. Nobody saw any crocodiles. It wasn't important. They thought, why not? But uh, as they started to recover, and once again started to eat people, politicians and the public started to say, enough's enough. For like, how many crocodiles do you want? Um, and so that's when we really started to pursue giving them an economic value at all costs, any way we could, through various use programs. The argument being that if your livelihood is dependent on something, you don't necessarily like it, but you want to make sure you keep it there. It suddenly took conservation away from whether you like crocodiles or didn't like crocodiles. Just about everybody likes something that generates benefits, economic benefits for them. So even for people like me, that like crocodiles just because they're crocodiles. Uh, I have to adopt different values to sell conservation to the public. You have different values. So the problem that caused the decline was, um, I don't know how to do this now, but was clearly the demand of crocodiles for um, fashion leather and the solution was to find legal ways of, of meeting that goal. So our population, if you look on the left, is in, in the numbers of animals, and you can see that that is now tailed off, that line is, is where the maximum is rich. We've brought crocodiles back to their original abundance. The biomass is still increasing because the bigger crocodiles are getting bigger. Very successful. But Crocodiles are a serious predator. They're, they're not something you mess with. If you swim in some of the rivers next to Darwin, there is a 100% chance you'll get killed. It's, the question is, if you're a betting person, whether it's going to happen in five minutes or 10 minutes, and you're never going to get to 15 minutes. It's, it's, that's without a doubt. And if you look at where the crocodile attacks are occurring, that has been assembled by Adam Britton and uh, that other guy that works on this, 
you can see right over the region, the saltwater crocodiles, there are massive uh, problems with attacks on people. The only countries that are, don't have attacks are up in uh, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, where the crocs are basically extinct. So the, the, the message is pretty clear. If your crocs are extinct, you don't have attacks on people. And if they're not extinct, you're going to have a problem with attacks on people. And in East Timor, for example, the rate of attack has just been escalating uh, dramatically since in, in the last few years. And we're fairly sure this is due to crocodiles moving from Australia to East Timor. That's only 450 kilometres away. So now we have a problem because if we hatch sea turtles and someone in the Solomon Island eats a sea turtle, Australians, oh, what are they doing eating our sea turtles? Now the shoe is on the other foot because it's our crocodiles that seem to be moving to East Timor and eating people. So who is responsible now? You know, the government, not quite sure how to deal with this, but we're trying to collect DNA evidence now that, that we'll, I'm, I'm sure will we'll point out that these crocs are coming from the north. People in the oil rigs between Australia and Timor are seeing saltwater crocodiles moving back and forth, and there's a lot of other circumstantial evidence. This whole issue of people uh, and crocodiles is a serious one. So. Everyone knows that what this problem looks like, it's, it's horrible, it's occurring all over the region, and the solution, strangely, now is turned back to the industry, that if you can make them uh, valuable to people through these companies, like these high fashion luxury companies, are creating a market, and then it's up to different countries to work out how best to use that market to generate benefits, economic benefits for people and economic benefits for the country. If you choose not to do it, that's great. You're going to have grave trouble trying to work out how to make people live with crocodiles because they won't do it and nor should you expect them to do it. Everyone's got a right to protect their children. So we work with uh, the indigenous people up there um, in, the, in egg collection and incubation, they're looking after hatchlings. The nests near uh, the saltwater crocodiles have become a valuable asset. In Papua New Guinea, the only source of cash income to many indigenous people, the only source, the only mechanism they've got for getting any money for medicines, any money for their kids' education, comes from crocodiles and to the people who, and they harvest them sustainably, to the people who oppose the use of animals for any reason, I would say get out of conservation because it's not the field for you. You're not gonna, it's not going to work. You've just got to learn to be uh, adapt to the real world. Crocodile farming has now really come up in many, many countries often based on ranching programs where they're the best because if the eggs come from the wild every year, then you've got an economic benefit, an economic interest in preserving the wild habitats and looking after them. If you want to produce them all from captive breeding, you could do that in France next to the warm water of a nuclear reactor or something and all the wild crocs will go extinct. So, Trying to make your habitats valuable is, is going to work much better than just assuming that everyone's going to learn to love crocodiles and, and conserve them as a consequence. So, you know, everyone's familiar with what's involved in this. It's best not to be too squeamish about killing crocodiles. They're only the same as any other animal. You've got enough of them, it doesn't matter. The thing is that the industry is generating livelihoods for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the world, and this makes crocodiles important. Tourism, 
is a very important additional source of income. We, we exploit everything we can with crocodiles, and crocodile farms around the world all have tourism. The manufacturer of products is a major employer of people. It gives you more and more livelihood benefits. There's all sorts of farms in all sorts of places. These, these ones are in Cambodia, out on the lakes where they farm them in little boxes in the water. Um, you know, crocodile farms, doesn't matter what country you go to. For us, our industry now in the north, we're only a little place, remember, is worth around $100 million a year. So suddenly governments sit up and take notice. You know, you go and tell them to conserve the lesser speckled reed wobbler that, that nobody's the slightest been interested in, and the governments have trouble allocating money from health and research and roads to the lesser speckled reed wobbler. But you go to them and tell them you've got an industry that's generating $100 million a year with some very sharp business people involved in, in, the, in the conservation as well as the industry, and governments are far more likely to support the program. So many lessons learned. Crocodiles are tenacious survivors. That if, even though they're in low density, if you give them a chance, they'll recover. They compete with local people. They're difficult to live with. Financial incentives really help. Governments pay more attention to uh, wildlife that's generating income. The worst conservation threat in the world is poverty because when you live in poverty, it doesn't matter what the law says, you'll do anything to feed your children and look after your children, and so you should be expected to do so. The population dynamics of crocs that are studied by many biologists are not really what you need. What you need to understand is dynamic populations, how populations respond to reductions in number, because you find that there are enormous density dependent responses that are often ignored, they're often difficult to study, but they're very dynamic entities. Crocodile species with no commercial value, and Mindarensis approaches this problem, are a particularly difficult conservation problem, and here my guess is that, that really the industry input here is, is being very, very important, not not because of money at all, but because industry has different insights into how to market something, how to do something, how to do something in the real world. And so that the program here that industry is behind is a very good example of how you get a sustainable program going that's not dependent on donors, because donors soon get tired of you know, pouring money into something that they don't see many benefits from. Satellite farming to me is a great thing where you have a lot of different people doing a little bit and feeding it into one farm. That way you get more livelihoods, benefits. The brands, the big brands, play an absolutely significant role. They're the ones that where, without them there is no market. And attacks on brands by animal rights activists that believe that no people should use any animal for any reason are completely anti-conservation. They're causing huge problems. And uh, it's not in the best interest of you know, conservation at all. So bottom-up versus top-down management is usually the best way in some places. The local people have got to have some empowerment over what they do with crocodiles and not just be told. The benefits of trade and conservation are very poorly understood by the end consumer. You know, the lady sitting in Paris with her new Hermes handbag that costs $60,000 or something, having a cafe latte and a salad sandwich, doesn't understand that the people responsible for that may be very poverty-stricken people in the islands of Papua New Guinea. So this message has got to get through from, from the bottom to the top. Uh, conservation success stories just aren't understood at the high fashion level. And it's a problem because when someone comes in to buy a high fashion handbag, the, the people selling it don't really want to remind the people that it was once a live animal. 
you know, it doesn't sort of go to a high fashion. So on the one hand, they're being attacked, but on the other hand, they have difficulty marketing the conservation story. And, you know, we've been working extremely hard to try to work out how to, how to change that. And you yeah, must remember that CITES was designed to stop trade, driving species to extinction. It, it, it was... CITES is often interpreted as an anti-trade thing. It's not an anti-trade thing. It's designed to make trade sustainable. And people keep trying to use societies to stop trade, which is not in the interest of anyone. People and livelihoods are the most critical element for long-term management. Legal trade in crocodiles has largely eradicated illegal trade. Where we fit in the crocodile specialist group is we have many members that are involved in trade, many members that are not involved in trade. But we're interested in conservation, the use in trade, is, is of, this is the International Crocodile Farmers Association, which is a new group. They're interested in commercialisation. That, that gives you the incentives for conservation. So there's an intimate link between us and the industry. We've got to be careful. You know, some people in the industry want to take every crocodile they can and turn it into cash. And so that we, 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 it's, it's a narrow road to tread, but we have to do it. But problems still loom in this whole story. What's happening now is that uh, crocodile skins are becoming very abundant on the world market. And, you know, there's lots and lots of production going on. Some businesses have just gone in purely for production without worrying about conservation. And this, this is in China now. There's, there's skins and skins and skins coming out of Southeast Asia into China. They're very cheap and it's undermining a lot of the, the industry. And so when you look at the way any industry works, it works cycle, in a cycle, maybe 10 years, eight years, where there's a period in which demand exceeds supply and everyone starts to in And then they reach a peak where the market's satisfied and then there's a decline. Now, if conservation is linked to that marketing, conservation, incentives for conservation do exactly the same thing. They build up when, when the demand is high, but then as it starts to go down, um, you end up with the incentives for conservation disappearing. In the crocodile industry, some of the new grading standards that are coming in are so strict that some of the programs involving indigenous people and local people can't produce the skins that, to enter into the top market. So right now, we're wrestling with the problem of how to, how to do this because um, we need to make sure that we can get wild skins into the marketplace. So if you look on the longer term, what you're seeing is the same fluctuations with the overall trend to buying products can go up or it can go down. And this is all dependent on really public and political perceptions. So the biggest problem that we face in the world today is that an increasing number of well-meaning people are subjected to all this animal rights propaganda <coughs> that are coming from like hundreds of millions of dollars these companies generate. And they believe that it's irresponsible to buy animal products. So what you're seeing is that there's an overall long-term trend that's coming from all this media attention where people think, oh, I better not buy one of those because it's irresponsible. In actual fact, if they understand the conservation consequences, they will realise that it's responsible to buy such products. So um, I guess the in terms of actions, there's two sorts of actions. The little purple lines that are about stopping these massive fluctuations. But the big picture here is the one on the end of how you start to educate people that buying products from well-managed programs that have conservation benefits is actually good for people and it's good for conservation. So. Um, 
That's it. Thank you very much.